All right, I'm glad to see our viewers here on Fagin Live. It's Saturday, 23rd of April, 2204, Moscow and Kiev time. Glad to see you, Alexei. Likewise, we have 140,000 people watching us. Despite what you think about me, I still ask you to please share the links about these videos in your social media circles. Do not forget to leave a like and subscribe. If you are watching this in English, please uh, like and subscribe to the Privateer Station. That helps us greatly to disseminate this information. We'll start with Odessa today. I understand it would fit to say that there were there was a bit of a shelling of that city, and I think it's the first time the city got hit that hard. Actually, they were hit with cruise missiles before. It is hard for me to remember how much was it last time. This one, they said uh, there were four missiles, Russian strategic bombers uh, sent them from the Caspian Sea, our two BPLAs helped to intercept two missiles, two other missiles hit the multi-story building, and according to preliminary data, six people dead, over 20 wounded, and uh, one of the dead is a three-month-old baby. The data is being updated. Konoshenkov, Russian army representative, stated that they were attacking military facility. That is not me and not my butt, lying through his teeth again. I suspect they were shooting perhaps at some military location, but the results tell for themselves. He's saying they, they've been shooting at the military facility. Well, they have not shot the military facility. They've shot the three-month-old baby. All right, we'll talk about that as more data comes. Any more news today? It was one of the hardest days in uh, Mariupol's defense overall. After his statement that they were not going to storm the city, remember how Viktor Sivorov taught us to read Soviet papers? Yeah, in reverse. So today, Everything that could shoot was shooting at Azov Steel from the sea, from air, from land. I still don't know if they managed to get a single bus out from the ones that were in the humanitarian convoy. What's up on the north, on the Oz side, there were attacks of the enemy, we freed three small villages in Kharkov area, what else? I didn't mention yesterday that we hit the army level command post. 49th Army, two generals dead. Confirmed. Not ready to release names yet, but two are dead and one is very critical. Probably will not make it. Did you learn it through the intercepts? Intercepts and other means of intel gathering, and that's, yeah, that's what was there. Oh, besides, we also hit a big ammunition depot over there. It was a big one because it was exploding for over three hours. Oh, in Russia, they also stated they hit one of your ammunition. Depots. Yeah, they did. Uh, that did happen. They actually took it early, early on at the beginning of war. It's a big depot with uh, useless equipment, useless uh, shells that we could not use. It's past to past its uh, shelf time, shelf life. So we're not even trying to destroy, protect it. So finally, they had a chance to counter 
their depot being destroyed with that old canned version of new soap. That's what they brought up. So I heard that 64th Brigade that was uh, in charge of some of the crimes in Bucha for murders and rapes, they got into some military action near Izum and I understood that some of them were killed, some of them were captured. Uh, not exactly how it happened. They um, ran into one of our best brigades there, and we destroyed several units of their equipment, and uh, they retreated. We did capture a few soldiers, and, you know, if we captured them, they're very likely alive and okay. So... You know, we'll, we're keeping them to exchange for our own troops. And what if you capture some of those who are raping and murdering over in Bucha? Are you going to exchange them too? I don't know, really. It is a legal matter, so it depends upon the court and the president's decision. Was he willing to pardon them and exchange them, or should they stand in front of court? So that message I want to send to those soldiers in Russia who may think that it's okay to murder and rape, that, you know, if uh, you get captured later, your life may be at bigger risk, or you may not be uh, desirable to capture. Well, you know, Mark, oh, we cannot state that from Ukrainian side. Uh, we have to follow the Hague Tribunal and all that. So, But I can probably say that it matters if you serve in the detachment that uh, made itself famous for some atrocities. There might be some prejudice against you on the battlefield. And as I mentioned before, the old military saying that the earth is round, but it has the shape of the suitcase and once in a while you meet in the corners with people who wronged you, so... And again, going back to Putin, he recently awarded that gang of criminals from Bucha, the 64th Brigade, guard title. He basically awarded them for their crimes. But then he sends them to fight again? Do you think that's planned or that they don't have anything else? Could be true, and again, maybe maybe they're sending them with the reason that, you know, fewer people left from those crimes, uh, harder to find the culprits and those who did what. Or maybe they're just sending all the troops in war to just burn them all. So right now, on that direction, literally all of those whom they withdrew from Kiev and Bucha and the Northern Front, they're fighting in that area right now, in near Izum. Perhaps their logic is, where do we take the troops from? We find whom we can and throw them up. The ones from Kiev, Bucha and Chernigov are fighting there now. How many from your, in your estimation? From Kharkov to Mariupol, about 45,000. From those who are in Urpin, how many do you think? If there is at least one battalion tactical group from those who are up north, maybe 10, 12 battalion groups, then 12,000. Yeah, but that's just one brigade. There were about eight different kinds of troops, you know, airborne, tanks. Special forces. It's it's a lot of people, and the area was big. We're just trying to figure it out, you know. What's in Zaporozhye? What's in that part? Any advancement happening there? They perhaps pressed in for 10 kilometers in the past week, and they've taken about two villages, but they're facing some weird stuff happening to them. Things keep blowing up behind the front with their supply lines. Did you notice, by the way, things are happening in Russia too? Things are burning, set in a blaze. You notice that uh, the institute that developed Iskander missile burned to the ground. Oh yeah, Moscow also, the governor of Moscow, one of his houses burned today. You think those Bandera people? Um, I don't know. 
But, uh, you know, the other thing they're noticing that uh, military recruitment posts are catching fire. Something in Irkutsk was also on fire in the second half of the day. Perhaps a weird thing with fires this season. They're just not lucky with fires this season. You know, shenanigans. Oh, I'm coming, I'm myself from that area, I'm from Volga. Yeah, me too, I spent half of my childhood in that area. It was not too fun back in the days, and now with all the strange things happening, oh yeah. So what's with her son? So her son, yeah, we hit their fort, army command post, and the ammo depot. So I'm thinking, if we cut this head off, it likely will put a stop on their action for at least a week, because it's not just three generals in that tent. They usually have at least 40, 50 higher level officers around them, so at least for four or five days they would not even think about any military operations. What happens in such cases? Do they send a new commander? Usually you need to restore the command. So, yeah, there'd be screams, who died, how did you manage to lose them, who's responsible. On the other side, the elder officer left alive takes command, he says, I'm taking the command, and if he has initiative, he's running with it. If he lacks initiative, he calls Moscow and he he cries and says, so that's what happened. Then Moscow screams at him and says, uh, oh, you fucktard, you're in charge now, stop calling us. And then they find somebody deep in Siberia who is of appropriate rank, send him over. So it takes a few days for him to arrive, then he listens to the command. And then he comes to the front and talks to people who are left, and he's asking, how did you manage to lose them? You hopefully will protect me a little better. Do you have a map? No, we lost the map when everything burned last time. Do you have anybody who knows the area, who knows what's happening? So they find somebody who is fresh and everything, and that person trains him on the tactical situation, and then he's finally somewhat ready to start moving. So the destruction of a, such an outpost is a very strong hit. The detachments are never too quick to recover from that. Of course, they'll keep fighting on the detachment level and battalion level, but they will not be able to fight as a coherent army. They could not really do that before too effectively, but now it'll just be missing as a link. Also, ammo depot is bad news for them, because they got artillery, they got jets who need to drop things, they got artillery who need to shoot shells, so they'll be very modest at doing any active actions against us for a while. So, Dvornikov Probably that new commander pushed them all forward and they tried to advance and they, you know, part of it was also pushing the command too close to the front. And that's what killed them. You know, under Kiev there was another command post for the army that was just 12 miles away from the military engagement, so we could not not attack such a present, and we, of course, demolished them too. So yesterday when I got news, I did not believe it initially. I even wrote my tweet was about the battalion level outpost, and then I got confirmation that, no, it was an army outpost, so I had to go back and correct the tweet that it was a military, the army level command post. All right, so the next matter is President of Ukraine, Zelensky, had a big press conference in Subway. Yeah, he had 150 journalists. So on the question about the supply of armaments that you guys are getting everything that you need and it's underway. To be precise, he said that everything is going, everything is moving, that America expediting their tempo. 
for which we are very thankful, and tomorrow Blinken and probably Austin will be in Kyiv. So there will be a discussion, because next week American Parliament will be voting for land lease, and that will be a big principal change for that war in our favor. So that basically is announced that Blinken is coming. The president already announced that visit is happening. All right. Do you think after them, in some perspective, Biden may come as well? He might, but it'll be more symbolic support because Blinken and Austin can solve most of the actual content matters, subject matter issues. It's the head of the foreign affairs and the head of the Minister of Defense in our terms. So they're high-level figures, but it would be nice to also have Biden in Kiev, even symbolically. All right. Um, what about European partners, Germany and others? We heard that France was supporting armaments for a while. Internal document the Telegraph published. There were a lot of countries in Europe that were supplying Putin's regime, and some of them were exclusively military staff, some of them dual use. And that's kind of a bad optics hit for the West, especially in the eyes of those people in Ukraine who think that the West is perfect and that is never in error. Because here there is the West who is supporting Putin's regime with the military equipment and at the same time expressing huge concern with the lives of Ukrainians and talking about possible disaster and possible war. And, you know, and then we find in Russian tanks uh, better aiming systems and in Russian panzers the protection, protective vehicles from aerial assault, enhanced transmissions. So France supplied about a thousand targeting systems, so they modernized about a thousand Russian tanks and armored vehicles to a very serious 21st century level aiming system. And these are the same people who are guarantors in Russia not attacking us. Here's the modern world for you. So, dear friends, you can start you can start sobering up on that information. And the president, of course, knows more things he cannot disclose, but he's also being cynical. Things are not happening until he sees them happening. Right now, he is facing next very interesting conversation with Germany, especially in light of crisis they're going through after Schultz, after some materials floated up that uh, their leader was deceiving his own deputies and his own uh, Congress people and answering wrong questions. And there was a interesting table of things asked and how he answered, because he was deceiving his society for almost two months until this was uncovered. He was lying to coalition, he was lying to his media, he was lying to his partners, and he was not lying when he was caught, he was actually lying to protect his interests. And then another member of his coalition was also caught being a that many people away from themselves, there'll be no coalition. But German politics is a mysterious entity, like things they're bringing up about Merkel and her reign and her reaction of deep concern. One should look at the destiny of Bundeswehr, the German army. 16 years of Merkel management pretty much destroyed it. 
How did that happen? Well, they cut the finance off, they changed a lot of training programs, they kicked the people out who were taking good pro-European, pro-NATO position, but critical to some of these new changes. And they were supportive of conversations about minorities and stuff like that. So, like one of the publicists wrote, it's the army that once got the whole world afraid of itself. Yeah, is now a, basically a platform for discussion of alternative sexual behaviors. So it is a reason for Merkel and the other leaders in Germany to give it a deep thought. What did they bring to their country? Because I think this war will tear down a lot of masks and will show what is hiding behind them. As a lot of people will see the true situation of Germany's relations with Putin and who was in charge of uh, practically feeding him and giving him rise to power. And he was in charge of stopping Ukraine from being from joining the NATO or joining the EU back in the day and who is in charge, who is to blame for Bucha and other places and all the children killed in Russian Ukraine war who was forgiving that, who was supplying the equipment, who was telling F you to Ukraine, you're not European, so we could not join Так. Uh... All right, second time I'm sending a call, 300,000 people watching us. Some of them are sending me memes that I'm always talking about likes, and you, as if you're talking with and and ums, these people are funny. So over 300,000 people watching us, please share, subscribe and like. Same thing, don't forget to do that on the English version of this show. If you want it to be shown and displayed on more monitors, that also pisses off Kremlin. We've seen them almost literally noticing what we've been talking here. And they've tried to block us here on YouTube. They were reporting our videos for offensive content. You know what, they may be a real force on the digital front when they collect at least 37,000 people watching their own casts live. I don't think they ever do on the propaganda news, doubt so. Well, you know, they need to do something, they need to talk about something that excites people. I don't know, show something. Oh yeah, they've been showing their naked butt for the last 20 years. They were not developing stuff, not doing anything good in their country. All right, traditional question about this, the negotiations, if anything happened there, why is it important for us? Because war will always end with a victory or defeat, but in any case, they will, it will end with negotiations. It is pretty simple, because Russians have three options, positional war and negotiations after the defeat, and the third is the total mobilization of society. In our case, we only have two options, negotiations or fighting till the end and mobilizing our society to win this war on the battlefield. And that's what our president noticed, that if Russia will do a referendum in one of these uh, fake republics, and they already actually started doing some things like conscribing the medical service in Kherson to serve their military needs, if they will create one referendum, we are exiting and leaving the negotiations. We we'll just take that off the table. Then it will be land lease goods talking in our skilled hands on the front lines. So going back to that land lease, anything that maybe Americans have, American equipment that could be game changer in the field, 
maybe some armored vehicles, maybe jets, bombers. We published the list today of what uh, they gave us. It's public now. Looks very impressive. But it's not even land lease, it's a precursor to that. So what's the nuance? Every military thing has uh, two components to it, the base and the enhancement. So enha the base is usually the hardware, armored vehicle, transport, gun, something. Enhancement is something like targeting system. So the usual artillery, when it's not being corrected, in order to destroy the platoon, uh, or actually no, the, the uh, next level up, on the field they need about 140 shells to destroy that. With uh, corrective option to the fire and a bit more accurate firing solution, you only need nine shells to destroy such an outpost. Almost every detachment that we have has an unmanned aerial vehicle that is correcting fire. So Americans are giving us, I don't remember, 100 or 200 special Intel UAVs. They're also giving us switchblade systems. There are different types. They're basically kamikaze drones. They can be light or heavy. Light one flies for about 10 kilometers and destroys uh, lightly plated armor. Artillery system, uh, personnel carrier, armored personnel carriers. Heavy one flies much further and can also destroy heavy things like tanks. And we've got about 700 of those. Is it enough? That is a lot. Let's say it this way. It is a lot in order to let's say, in two directions of their main offensive, to make sure that Russians would be afraid of every bird flying over their head and would be digging themselves deeper in the ground, because that plane fear or drone fear uh, gets to you in about four or five days. Even the brave people get it because the effect is stunning. And now add to drone 150 millimeter artillery. It seems like the whole world is giving us their systems for four to six artillery brigades and Americans are also giving us reactive fire systems like HIMARS, very precise, much better than Hurricane or Grad the Russians use, just the next level of that system, better targeting and hit stronger. So at their 20 planes that we repaired and got from somewhere, and when Land Lease turns on, it'll be interesting to see. What do you think will be there? I think it'll be similar equipment, similar items, but in better condition. Because imagine what if what happens if American military will start actually producing things for Ukraine. Because right now they're just giving us stuff that was in the warehouses, that was conserved, some are in reserves, and now they could be giving us new things that are just manufactured, purposely manufactured for Ukraine. It is not a secret that, for example, some of the NLAW system did not work or malfunctioned because uh, their shelf life is about nine years for the battery, and some of them were borderline shelf life, so we had to refurbish their batteries and use them. So one thing is when you get something from the warehouse, but the other is when you get new. Also, what else? We have 200 uh, armored vehicles, millions of different ammunition, hundred thousand of shells. 
artillery is extended or the blade for 152 howitzers. And by the way, they're interchangeable. You can use them on both American and French. And some of them also have uh, active targeting systems. They fly far and they hit hard. So when people say they settle up slow but then ride fast, it's really not about Russians, it's about Americans, I think. That's what Churchill also said, that Americans will for sure make the right decision, but only after they try every other one. So it seems like they're getting now to the final, to the right decision after trying different other options. I understand, though, you know, that people are faulty. There are some people screaming that our allies got to be perfect. Um, they don't realize that surgeons have, a, they're saying that a good surgeon has a cemetery of his own before he becomes a good surgeon. President will probably have tens of cemeteries like that affected by his decisions until he becomes a good president. So. We think that the quantity will start turning into quality about the mid-May time frame. That's soon. Yeah, in about three weeks. By the end of May, it'll be a decisive advantage, I think. End of May, beginning of June. And those areas where we have some active fighting. It's very interesting time frame. Yeah, this is the phase of oppositional warfare when Russian troops are already tired and cannot carry out effective offensive operations. But at the time, we shall gain new capabilities and we'll hit them hard. There was a question about the bridge over Crimea. How safe is that bridge? This is the question people keep asking me. I have to ask you. I need to tell you that I have answered this question several times before, but once again, this bridge was built with a certain military standards to make sure that it is reliable and it's hard to destroy it, or it's very easy to bring it back to work after an attack. It is always covered by some air force that is flying around and monitoring that area so nothing flies in. There are also Navy elements that are guarding it, and in our case, we could only use planes, but again, that's useless because they'll be intercepted. There is anti-air system on each side of the bridge with a big coverage area, or another option is to hit it with the uh, .u, which is our cruise missile, but it only has about 110 kilometers effective range, and that bridge is way further out. So it's outside of our reach zone. I'm sorry that I brought this question up, but I was being asked. No, I understand it's better to answer and discuss it than admit it. Yes, I'm of the same opinion. All right, uh, next question about the eternal detachment, eternal division. This is an interesting idea. Originally, when people were carrying out around uh, the pictures of their grandfathers who fought in the Second World War, now there is an idea that floats to create such a parade in Mariupol and get some people wearing the pictures of the the ancestors? I don't think, I mean, I don't think it's realistic much, but if it is, that is not really a big deal. What I heard also is that they're trying, or perhaps will try to send our prisoners of war with uh, their pictures through the city. And I keep explaining that this is technically a war crime. You are not allowed to do that by Geneva Convention. But if Russia will do it, you know, they're doing anything they can to support their Hague Tribunal Court investigation. So if they do that, there is a Ukrainian word which you might say. Не обессудьте Russian, so don't blame anyone, but yourself. That's the meaning of it. If they do such a march, are they going? 
to do it on 9th of May for the Victory Day? Yeah, that's what I heard. So it's semi-official warning to Russian colleagues that will be hurtful if you try to do that, if you try to use prisoners of war in your military shenanigans. All right, 36 minutes, 35. We are live, 420,000 people watching us. About a third left their likes. You know what's funny for me? So 420,000, the likes are about five times less. Is it that difficult for people to click that and to like? Just click one button. Or do they think something like Aristovich, asshole, free Mariupol? I will not leave a like. And then you come there and say, hey, leave a like. No, I won't, because he still needs to work before I do that. I know, it just seems like that's the nature of human, because we did some stats, and it does appear that people like such an approach. They're just lazy, and some of them seriously think I'll do it tomorrow, and some of them just forget. Well, you know, we somehow need to win the information war with the Russian propaganda machine that throws $4 billion a year into their furnace. All we have is you liking our recordings or liking our streams. So if you don't do that, then it's real hard for us to compete. Dear sirs that are watching us, please do it. We still love you, though. Even if you don't leave us any like, we'll continue working and recording these shows for you. All right, it's Saturday, tomorrow is Sunday. We're meeting tomorrow again at 10 p.m. Remind you again, please subscribe to our channel, to channel of Alexei Rostovich. It's in the description below that video, and to channel of Fagin, Fagin Live. They're both in Russian, Ukrainian. If you want to watch that in English, subscribe to Privateer Station and leave a like. Let me ex explain the necessity of likes. We don't need that. In order for YouTube to show it as a trending video and to be displayed to many more people online, you need to leave your like. That makes this video a trending video that is being offered and recommended to a significantly wider audience. So that is why we're asking you to do that. All right, we've done our stuff. We worked hard. We'll see you tomorrow. We'll talk tomorrow. Alexei, thank you. Thank you to our viewers. Goodbye. Goodbye.